Okay, we are going to get started now. And uh, just by way of um, introduction, um, my name is Poncho Guevara. I'm the executive director of Sacred Heart Community Service, and I am a um, proud member of this reimagining um, uh, public safety community advisory committee. And um, I want to get this meeting um, going. And I just wanted to make sure that we do the beginning of every every meeting to, to um, uh, Indigenous land acknowledgement. And as we remember that that we are on the sacred grounds of the Muwekma Ohlone people, and our job is to not only be stewards of this land, but to seek justice um, in our community uh, collectively as we work to try to um, understand the challenges that we face as a community and society and work to try to make things better and acknowledge our responsibility in doing so um, in partnership with um, and following the legacy of our indigenous brothers and sisters. So to get us started today, I'm going to ask folks, we're going to do a breakout activity like we did last time. And I want to ask folks to answer the following question, which is, um, uh, in small groups, just so we get to know each other a little bit, um, both members of the public and um, and also uh, committee members. Um, share your name, affiliation, and who inspires you uh, to push for justice in your community. So, um, so we'll do this for about um, about five minutes. So there'll be about four or five people per group, I think, right now, and so. I'm going to create the breakout groups and I'm going to send you to your room. So you're going to be some people, you know, some people, you don't. So introduce yourselves and share a little bit about who inspires you to fight for justice. So, all right, here we go. Opening the rooms now and we'll be back in about at about 8, 11. Good morning, Rosie. Hi, Soma. Hi, Myra. Hello. Welcome. Welcome today. Um, uh, my name is Poncho. I'm an executive director here at Sacred Heart Community Service. And we are uh, we just started the meeting and we are doing a small breakout group activity. Um, and so we'd love to be able to have you share. Um, my uh, the breakout group activity is uh, basically name affiliation and um, who inspires you to uh, push for justice in your community. So, cool. I'm joining the breakout room now. Great. Let's see. 
Yeah. Awesome. Good morning, Kiana. Good morning. Uh, we're doing a little breakout activity for a few minutes. Um, so we're asking people to share the name, affiliation, and who inspires you to, um, to push for justice in your community. Okay, perfect, thank you. Sorry, can you send me back to the breakout room? We're actually just closing up the breakout room. Oh, okay. Room. I was like, I don't know what happened, but. <laughs> People are okay. coming back. Sorry. No, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we hope to continue to have this opportunity to be able to check in um, and share a little bit about ourselves throughout this process. So, um, so I'm glad that people were able to connect. So we're, I'm really excited to introduce um, uh, one of our Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory um, uh, Committee members, um, Lori Valdez, who's gonna share a little bit of her experience um, herself, her family, um, and to get us started and help ground us in this conversation today. So, Lori, you have the floor. Thank you, Pocho. Sorry, my voice is a little bit uh, <clears throat> raspy this morning. Hi, my name is Lori Valdez. I'm one of the appointed um, um, representatives um, representing Debug. I'm also a family that's been impacted by police violence since 2014. Um, I have an organization called Justice for Josiah, which was named after my four-year-old son who has had to grow up fatherless as a result of police brutality. And um, I want to share with everybody here that um, unlike the police that chose to be police officers, I was forced in the position I am in today. I didn't choose to be where I am today. It was and something that was forced upon my son to grow up fatherless, to live with this trauma forever. And one of the things I want to make sure people understand is when an officer kills your loved one, it's an unimaginable pain. And like you're in a, a fog and you lose your sleep, you lose your sense of peace, you lose your sense of who you are or who you were because the person you become is not the person you were prior to them taking your loved one. And um, Antonio was a very good person. He was very quiet. He had a 
very humble demeanor. He didn't speak English and didn't understand it that well. He knew very few words. And um, whenever he was stopped by police, because he was, because the way he looked, he would always respond to them with either, yes, sir, or it's okay. And that was his way of giving respect to them being in an authoritative figure. And um, the day that they killed him, um, the things that were said were like so unbelievable to me, like, because that was not in his demeanor. And I had, they kept the videos for five years away from us. Nothing was showed, everything was put on a gag order in his case. So it made me wonder, like, if they had nothing to hide, why the gag order? So when SB 1421 became law, and I requested everything that's according to that new law, they finally released one video, one. There's three videos. There's two from the officers, and there's another one from a third officer, but they've never released all of them. To this day, I still have not received Antonio's personal belongings going on eight years, I haven't received everything from the coroner's report, autopsy report, any kind. I only got what the district attorney in the initial San Jose PD did, which, you know, um, not everything that they said to the public is true and correct. And if the public were to know the deception and the lies and the attempt to cover up the wrong they did, it would be appalling where I would hope people would be upset that, wow, this is who we have, you know, um, in charge of our system that are supposed to be transparent and accountable because they are not, they make mistakes like us, but they can't own up to their mistakes. And so what I want to tell you all is that, yes, they took Antonio's life and there's no justice for him because justice would be for Antonio to be alive here today not be dead and far away from us in Nayarit, Mexico, where he was laid to rest. Um, so I want justice for my son and for every other child who has been left fatherless. We have many children who our communities forget. These men were fathers. There were mothers that were killed that left children behind. And these children do not, and I'm telling you, they do not get any support from our systems because of who killed their parent, and that should not be. My son, since he was four, has woken up crying numerous times. Even now, he's gonna be 12 this year, and he still he doesn't wake up crying as much, but now it's a different kind of part of the trauma. It's anger, it's depression, it's isolation, and it's just different things, you know? Um, but what hurt was when he was little, he would wake up crying for his dad, there was nothing in the world I could do. I couldn't take him to the doctors for medicine. There was nothing, you know, I couldn't fix what was broken, what he needed. And it made me feel helpless as a mom because we're supposed to protect our kids from pain, from trauma, from anybody hurting them. And that I could not fix. I could never in my life fix what the cops did that to his dad that day. So then I realized that my son was wanting to die a lot. He was always saying when he was little, I just want to die. I want the cops to kill me. I don't want to live here. This isn't the kind of life a normal kid has, you know? And he had to face things in school where kids would ask him, hey, Josiah, where's your dad? And he would say, I don't have a dad. The cops killed him. And the kids would say to my son, your dad must have been a bad person because cops only kill bad people. And that's not true. And Josiah had to defend his, his father's honor at the age of five, say, no, my dad wasn't a bad person. He just spoke, he just spoke Mexican. And you know, that hurt because at five years old, a child should not be worried about defending their, their parents' honor. A child should be worried about learning. A child should be learning about how to be interacting with other kids, you know? And he didn't want to go to school. And so I seen, he, you know, he had art therapy here to teach him about his emotions. And I noticed that as time he was getting older, he was not trusting many adults. 
He did not just trust you just because you came around or you were supposed to be somebody he trusted. He had, it took him a while to trust even his teachers. I've been an advocate for him at his school and telling the teachers what happened. So if Josiah acts up or he doesn't want to participate or he all of a sudden gets angry, I prefer for you to call me and I pick him up. Then you guys allow him to stay there with those emotions because none of our teachers are trauma informed taught that Josiah would end up getting in trouble and they'd call the police because he was, he hit somebody or did something, you know, and I didn't want that for him. He didn't need to go through more trauma by that way because not a single person understood the trauma he was going through. So I put it on the teacher's hands every year, no matter what, who teacher he got, hopefully the past, you know, the prior teacher does inform the new teacher, but I tell the new teacher, give the parents a heads up that there's a little boy in their class. Most of the parents know me, but there's some new ones. So give them a heads up. There's a little boy who lost his parent and I don't want them to hide it because I, I know they can't give me their emails. So they'll teach their kids to have empathy, to not say the wrong things to trigger him because it's not fair. So it's it's been a, a journey trying to get people to understand that there's many kids in our community. I have a Christmas event that I throw every year in December for the kids who have been left fatherless in California. They come from Southern California, Central California, East Bay, here locally. And um, this, is, this year will be the fifth year I've been doing it. And these kids look forward to this event because this is a space where healing can help happen and where these kids can understand and they know that each child there has suffered the same loss and so they have that bond you know but it's it's very difficult when you're you're trying to make your kids grow up okay like we have teenage kids that have today in fact today is one of our family's anniversary of their father being killed and today is also the birthday of two of the kids so these kids cannot celebrate their birthdays like they would before because that's the same day they killed their father and one of these kids has tried to commit suicide because he cannot handle the loss of his father when he's a teenager and he needs his father so much it's hard and uh, it, it's hard for me because not having trauma informed people in our schools, teachers, counselors, you know, we have cops, cops aren't even trauma informed properly. They don't realize the trauma they cause by their actions. They don't because they don't ever want to see the families or see the damage they do to the people in our community. You know, I don't wish any child, not even a cop's child to go through what my son has gone through or what all these children are going through without support from our systems, from our schools or anything because nobody knows how to handle it. So I've been, I've been that voice for these children and wanted to let you know that my son did go to counseling at school. He did have a counselor. And I would notice he would come back very upset or quiet all the time. And I would ask him why and he wouldn't tell me. So the following year, he was gonna, I was gonna sign him up because he still was having issues. And I said, if you don't tell me why, you don't wanna go to this counselor again, then you're gonna have to go like it or not because you need help. And he didn't want to, and then I said, okay, well then I'm gonna go sign the paper so you could go. And then that's when he told me that his counselor was telling him, Josiah, if you come in here talking about your dad again and you start crying, I don't wanna hear it. You need to get over it already. And when she said that to him, Josiah lost trust in any Buddy who is in that position of counseling therapist, he doesn't trust him. He refuses to this day to go talk to anybody, even though he still needs help. But I can't, because of that one person who said that to him, she silenced his pain and that's not acceptable. No child's pain should be silenced like that. Like you don't get over it. No, there's no time frame for how or when Josiah is gonna get over the loss of his dad. And so therefore I want people to understand that police violence, it does hurt. It takes a person's life, but there's the people that are left behind, the families, there's the innocent children that are suffering in the shadows that nobody ever wants to address. 
and we need to put the kids at the forefront and realize that when an adult actions affect an innocent child in a negative way, we need to take action immediately and prevent further trauma to these children and our community because it's not fair. Our children deserve the best from all of us. And if one child fails and becomes a statistic of the system, it's because we all failed that child. It takes a village and this village needs to step up to the plate and remember to put the children at the forefront also. They need to have their voices heard. Nobody's listening to the kids. Nobody's helping these kids. They're going to grow up broken men and become the same thing that was inflicted on them. Repeat that pattern of violence or end up what, how they perceive cops is what happened to them. So if they perceive a cop as a monster, like I've told many cops, cops have approached Josiah at different things, try to talk to him. And I don't teach him to be afraid of them. And the officers have told me it hurt that my son looked at them like if they were a monster, that the look in his eyes, they never thought that a kid would look at them like that. And I said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but that's, you know, I didn't teach him that. That's because of the effect of what happened to his father. You guys are the monsters in his dreams. You guys are not people who save and protect him. You, he will never trust any of you until somebody starts taking accountability for their actions. And we start seeing that they, their actions are not the, the kind of role models we want for our children. I don't want my son to think become a cop and you could kill anybody and get away with it. And that's what he was thinking before, that he wanted to become a cop so he could kill all the bad cops. And that is not okay with me. I do not want my son to think that it's okay to kill people because you're a cop, because it's not. I don't care if you're a cop, I don't care who you are. You have no right to take another person's life. You are not God. So um, if anybody wants to know more, I have the justiceforjosiah.org. It's justice and then the number four. And you can uh, learn more about what we've done. We are starting a, a mentoring program for these children. And it's called, Josiah named it, and he wanted to name it Helping Hearts to Heal because all the little hearts that are broken need to heal. And so we have started our mentor project. So and we're gonna start taking you know, registration for the families, get input. We ask that if anybody wants to be a mentor, that it has to be a one year commitment and it has to be from your heart that you really wanna help these kids heal. Um, we'll be putting it up, we'll have our webpage up connected with the Just for Josiah Facebook page. So thank you Poncho for allowing me to share this with everybody and I hope Everybody heard with your heart and you understand that police violence, it hurts. And I don't wish any of you to walk in our shoes. I don't. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I'm gonna pass it over to um, advisory uh, committee advisory member, um, Dr. Will Armelin from San Jose State, uh, uh, San Jose State University, uh, director of the Human Rights Institute. Will. Thank you, Poncho, and many thanks to Lori. Lori, it's so good to hear from you, fam. I know this is exhausting for you to do, but I know everyone appreciates it so much and it's super important for this work. Um, I can't think of a better way to go into our presentation for today because we're gonna be presenting a ton of data and it's very easy to get caught up in all of that statistical nonsense and forget that all of those numbers represent real people with real lives and real families and real consequences. And so I, I really think it's important that as we go through the material for today, that, that we kind of keep that in mind and that every, every one of these statistics we talk about represent the whole family and community that are affected by, by that injury or by that death. Um, so at any rate, I, I am gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, Poncho, for introducing me today. Um, it's our job uh, uh, as an institute this week to, to present some material for the committee. And so today what we're going to do is present some very basic, 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 basic background scholarship and data on the issues that bring us together as a committee and on the issues that sort of um, uh, contextualize and inspire the, the, the social movement of Black Lives Matter and the broader criminal justice reform movement. So what we're going to do is I, I, I'm going to school today. So we're, we're starting classes this week. So I'm, I'm in professor mode. I apologize ahead of time. I'm going to share a screen with a bunch of notes and a bunch of data and these sorts of things. 
please don't get overwhelmed. I'm going to make sure that all of this is distributed to all of the committee members and, and audience members as well. So don't worry if you don't get it all today. We're not going to be able to talk through all the details you see in the document. That's why you're all going to get it to keep. We're going to wrap up actually. So I'm going to try not to talk too long. So we have time for a video. It's about 10, 15 minutes long, but it's, it's, I think an excellent piece of content for us to share together uh, by a, a critical scholar that, that's really been one of the lead scholars in this, this sort of field and in this topic. Um, and I think it'll uh, bridge some gaps for us in our understandings of how sort of data and, and, and theory match up with what people have been doing in the streets. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here quickly and get right into it. So again, I know this is going to be a ton of text. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to read this all to you. This is all like sort of lecture notes that we can all keep. Uh, I also want to be clear, like we're all adults, right? So I want to make sure that I'm respecting everybody and in their intellectual capacity. And I'm not going to assume people don't understand things and can't handle a lot of information. So, so this, all this information is for you and for us to arm us for our, our conversations and our work moving forward. And again, um, all of this will be sent to you. So if we don't go over all the details, you'll get it. Uh, if you want, as I'm going through, because I'm going to move fast, please raise your hand. I'll stop as best as I can. I apologize ahead of time for Omar because I'm going to speak really fast and he's going to have to translate. So I apologize. Um, as you'll see, we'll have a couple points where I'm going to pause for questions and comments. So don't worry. We're not, I'm not just going to run over everybody. Um, but as I said, I'm going to try and, and keep an eye on time and move us through this content as best I can. So to begin, I want to start with basics, which is how social scientists think about the police. How do we define them? How do we think about their history? These sorts of things. So first, um, the police are understand, understood as the coercive arm of the state. Now, by coercive, I'm not being judgy, I'm being objective, right? By this, we mean this is the arm of force that the state uses to maintain control, order, and so forth. Um, now, the police represent what we call the monopoly on the use of force. And this is what makes the state unique. And this is why a police officer or a law enforcement officer has the right to kill, detain, and surveil. And you and I and other public employees and private employees don't have that. The reason is because they represent the state's monopoly on the use of force. And how does that work? And what does that mean? Well, according to the political theories that supposedly inspired our Constitution and Western law in general, this is done through a social contract, right? For those of you who remember school, we're talking Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, all these fools. And so what did that mean? Well, the social contract meant that we give up certain individual rights, like my individual right to cage or kill somebody that I think broke the law or violated my rights in some way. And I give those rights up to a state. And in return, in return uh, for me, I get promises by the state to be protected. And I get promises by the state that that use of force will be done according to the law. And in such a way that is transparent for me and other members of the public to suggest that that force is in fact legitimate or what we call a legitimate authority. The point of this is the following, that the reason cops and law enforcement officers have a license to do things the rest of us don't is because there's this basic agreement supposedly that all of that use of force is legitimate in the eyes of the public. And in theory, if that use of force is ever illegitimate in the eyes of the public, then the state loses that legitimacy and, and monopoly on the use of force. Now, of course, this is a theoretical uh, discussion uh, uh, in, in real time and in real law. It would not operate this simply, but I think it's really important for us to understand the concepts that are behind our institutions. Um, and so how do we think about, you know, defining the police further? The state functions for all kinds of purposes, some manifest and some latent, right? Manifest functions or purposes are the things they say they're there for. So maybe uh, crime control, uh, lowering violence or property destruction, these sorts of things. But there are also latent functions, things that are unspoken, but are real nonetheless. So the other functions of policing might be like protecting the property of the rich, might be protecting the rights of white folks. And of course, for students of history, as we're going to go into in a minute, you might recognize that not all of those latent functions have always been latent, that over history, some of those functions have actually been quite outspoken and actually part of the law. And so that brings us into our next big question that I get all the time, which is, where do the police come from and do they really all come from slave catchers? And so to that question, I'm going to answer yes and no. It's way more complicated, go figure, than all of, your than all of the internet posts. 
right? So when we look at the, the history of the police, we do have to see it as a more complicated history. And there are at least four sort of roots that I would ask us to think about in their history or their origin. The first actually is from the control of, of enslaved populations. So from uh, slave catchers, uh, 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 bounty hunters and slave patrols, the first slave patrol actually was in 1704. Slave patrols actually were not around for the entirety of chattel slavery. They actually appeared toward the end. And so this is partly why I'm making this point historically that policing as we know it actually appear more from the end of the period of slavery and the beginning of the period of Jim Crow. And the reason that this is the case is because the criminalization of blackness in the United States happens as formerly enslaved populations are freed, right? And it happens in response to the black uplift from the Civil War and black reconstruction. This is something that our video is going to speak more to, so I'm going to keep, keep it moving. Um, so in other words, Yes, there is some history in, in, in our history of chattel slavery and the attempts to control uh, uh, freed slaves in, uh, all across the United States, but primarily on the East and in the South. Secondly, we have historical connections as is incredibly important for our region, incredibly important. Um, it, we have historical connections to Western expansion in the quote unquote frontier across the 17 and 1800s. And so during that time, we have this weird sort of blending of forces where we have uh, 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 mobs, uh, 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 sort of vigilantes, settlers, and these early law enforcement agencies that would later become sheriffs, folks like the Texas Rangers and these sorts of sorts of folks who are really sort of laying this, this uh, uh, expansion out in a very violent way. And this also involved mass lynchings across the Southwest and California of Mexican populations and, and indigenous populations, remembering that again, at this time, uh, all of these lands were actually uh, uh, rightfully and legally owned by indigenous tribes or by the Mexican, the early Mexican state. Third, um, we actually need to recognize the historical development of policing, incarceration, and the modern criminal justice system in the West that's going to occur across the late 1700s a little bit, but mostly across the 1800s or what we call what we'd say the 19th century. And so this is kind of in sync with the development of like the modern city and modern sort of industrial capitalism in the 1800s. This is also a period of colonization of the world. So it matches some of the creation of those colonial cities as well. And during this time, um, uh, criminal, the early sort of criminal justice scholars and professionals, if you will, in Europe and the United States were creating the first police forces as we know them, municipal forces. The first one was in Boston in 1834, or I'm sorry, 1838. And then by the 1880s, like every city in, the, in the, the United States and Europe had a municipal police force and they were sort of like professional schools of policing across those, those communities or across those, those countries. Now, the other thing to remember here is like what this is replacing in that history and in this sort of like development of municipal government, it replaced in the city structure what was called the night watch. So the other thing to remember here is policing and municipal police forces are really a modern invention. For most of the history of this country, they really did not exist. It was only really at the point where cities become huge, really densely populated and really diverse that we see these municipal police forces arise at this sort of like stage of industrial capitalism in American and in European cities. And so this is another origin, this sort of like development of um, municipal government and, and these sort of notions of, of, of control and order within that municipal government in the West. Lastly, and this is one that I don't think gets nearly enough attention. Um, and part of that is because for very, very good reason, we're very focused on race in a lot of these conversations, but the, the variable that really gets missed and I, I think is critical to remember is class. And so police have a very deep history in the breaking uh, or in, in the, their use uh, in class war. And I mean class war in the direct sense. I mean like killing, uh, uh, beating, uh, 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 coercing uh, 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 laborers directly and their families and their children. Um, the, the, the history of labor in this country across the frontier or even on the East Coast in the industrial North or in the coal mines or any, and I can go in any of this if anyone likes, is extraordinarily bloody. And what capitalists used to coerce labor before police were these uh, uh, sort of private contractors, one that you would know because they're still around, it's called the Pinkertons. 
The Pinkertons were used by like the early ma railroad magnets out in the West where there were no police to beat back laborers or beat back immigrants who were working for them. And, and in the East, they would hire other kinds of sort of organized thugs. Well, as the 1800s developed along with these, these municipal forces, these police forces and other law enforcement off, uh, agencies came to replace these private contractors when it came to beating the crap out of laborers who were refusing to work on strike, asking for more or what have you. A lot of our early sort of labor history in the United States where we hear of like socialists and anarchists being hung and all of these sorts of things come from this history. Uh, our, our history of May Day right across the world, this labor holiday comes from that history, right? The Haymarket Square Massacre. And so this also um, is part of our origins of police as we know them. Okay, I just ran through hyper fast, a ton of material and I wanna stop for a second for questions, comments, or anything you'd like me to back up or, or, or expand on. Please go ahead and raise your hand, jump in, whatever you would like to do. And I see you, Paul. Yes, uh, morality is a moral failure. Uh, go ahead, sir. Oh, first of all, thank you for, for that. Um, yes, it, it was very quick. Um, what, what I would have liked to have uh, received more is just the history of San Jose. Okay, because the police department in 1849 was instituted. Okay, in, in 1851, January 6th, Peter Burnett gave a speech right here downtown. You know where the jazz festival was? Everybody was having a good time there. Well, that was the exact ground within the California state legislature. That's where the building was, Cesar Chavez Park. And what Peter Burnett gave a speech at that time, and he stated, quote, that the war of extermination against the Indians is without exception to be expected. Although it is with great regret, it is beyond the will or wisdom of man to avert. Okay, and what followed from that was $5 per decapitated head. Yes, I said that correctly. $5 per decapitated head and 25 cents per scalp. And what was happening was within this area, when the people were starting to go to the hills because they saw these gavachos that were crazy. They were like, what? What are you guys doing? What they started doing, the gavachos in this area, is they started grave robbing and they would go and they would dig into the graves of the Mexicans, cut their head off and come and bring it to the local magistrate. And what they would do is give them receipts for five bucks. What the San Jose Police Department did, what their function was, social function, was to protect that system. So that, that's why I, I feel that, that I, I appreciate your presentation. However, the San Jose history needs to be centered because this was the first state capital of California for the first two years between 1849 and 1851. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And actually that is so good for us right now and I'll make a connection. So so I thank you. And, and this is part of the reason I, I leave this break. So I knew we would have this kind of uh, uh, interaction. And and so there's lots of things that I wanna bring in that I, you know, I'm, I'm cutting for time, but I'm so glad that you did that, Paul, because I wanna make that connection. And there's other connections to this history that we can make as well. So just as, as Paul made the excellent connection um, in terms of this Western expansion to the creation of, of our actual police forces in San Jose, which was not unique. That's what happened in sort of municipal areas all over the state and all over the Southwest at that time. During that exact same period that he's talking about, and by the way, anyone who wants to know more about that history and know more specifically about the use of scalp and beheading for bounty, uh, I put it in the chat, but her name is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She has several excellent works on this history, one of it being the indigenous history of the United States, where she goes very, very deeply into that, into that past and in all the practices that Paul described, and he's absolutely correct. The thing that I would even add is not only the historical relevance of, of Caesar of Cesar Chavez Park where the Jazz Fest has been, but during that same historical period, we also had some of the last lynchings uh, in, in, in San Jose of, of Latino, two Latino men, by the way, in St. James Park, right? And there's even some artwork that's been done out of uh, Japantown that commemorate that, that lynching and all these sorts of things. So we do have sort of uh, local historical connections to that explicit history of, of policing uh, coming from Western expansion 
all around us in San Jose, ones that, that Paul mentioned, ones that I mentioned, and there are uh, fortunately and unfortunately many, many others. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to go into some of those and maybe Paul and others can go into some of those as well uh, when, we, when we have time. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna keep moving because I, I do have to keep us to time. We have some other things to do. I'm not going to go through all of these statistics, so I'm going to sort of hit main points so we understand the broader, uh, 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 broader strokes of where we are on these issues. And then the video is going to sort of exclamate some of these some of these points. Um, uh, and as far as my thoughts of where U.S. policing veered from the European, um, that's a difficult question because you're you're talking about both are involved in settler colonial enterprises. The difference between Europe and the United States is Europe's colonization is elsewhere, with the exception of the Irish, um, where the United States is, is really expanding upon its own frontier. And so what you're going to have is like European municipal policing in Europe is going to take a certain form, but their policing of their colonial states is going to take quite a, quite a different one. Whereas in the United States, those things kind of blur together in a, in a more uh, interesting and difficult way to, to, to sort of disarticulate. Um, so I know that, that that may not be a long enough answer for your question, Chad, but but uh, that's my best in, in short order. Um, moving to, to to data, you know, what do these things look like? And how, how, do, how do our, how does the data look in terms of police violence? And, 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 and uh, how does that break out in terms of race and class and other sorts of things? So first of all, a lot of our statistics are are, are listed in terms of killings and shootings. And so I want to differentiate quickly. So killings refer to folks who are killed from any interaction with a law enforcement officer. And that can happen from uh, uh, all kinds of things. It could be George Floyd kind of cases from, from, from holds, uh, from other kinds of injuries, but not necessarily all from shooting, right? It could also be forms of neglect, et cetera. Shootings are shootings, right? And so it's, the problem with looking at some of this data that's been collected is that some of it's on shooting, some of it's on killing, some of it's on both. And so as you, you know, as we move on as a group and you get all these statistics in front of you, you're going to want to be able to differentiate what the statistics mean. So uh, one of the other things that we have to remember about this data is that it is quite incomplete even still. And so Yes, police killings include in custody deaths. Um, um, also, in terms of if, if neglect can be proven, right? Um, uh, it's a little bit of a gray area, but yes. So, um, what we found basically after the first uh, Black Lives Matter rebellions was that the FBI data was horrifically undercounted by over 50%. And so what happened after that is the Washington Post and other groups like uh, uh, Mapping Police Violence. It, uh, started in order to sort of fill that, gate, that data gap. And so what they started doing is collecting uh, news stories and trying as best they could to just sort of scour the news um, and other records uh, to put this data together. But we have to recognize that this, this still does not replace actual reporting from law enforcement agencies. And so it's still the case in the United States that we still don't actually know the, the real legitimate numbers on these issues. So that's something to keep, keep in mind. These are our best attempts um, to get at those numbers. So again, for mapping police violence, uh, so far in 2021, police have killed 657 people. Um, a majority of those are in the largest city. Well, not a majority of those, but it's the most significant number of those are in the largest cities in the United States, anywhere between 25 and 30 percent, actually. Uh, black folks are 30 percent of, of the people killed in those 100 police departments, uh, despite only being 21 percent of the population. Uh, black folks are 13 percent of the national population as well. 44% of unarmed people killed um, were also black. And so we also have a vast dis disparity of those unarmed folks who were African-American. Uh, also from the Washington Post Fatal Force Project. And this, this is also um, so slightly different. This is mapping police shootings. So fatal shootings by police. Fatal police shootings in the US are fairly consistent at around a thousand a year. And actually in general, we use this statistic to talk about it, basically police killings as well, because they're, they're relatively close. So fatal shootings are around a thousand a year. Police killings are between a thousand and 1500 a year. And that's been pretty consistent for several years now. And it's, it's very much on trend statistically. Um, uh, black and Hispanic Americans are fairly shot at much higher rates than whites. So what I want to point out is that both uh, African Americans and quote unquote Latinos, Hispanics, are, are shot in the United States fatally at twice the rate of whites. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So twice the rate of, of whites 
And for African Americans, it's more than twice the, the rate of whites. Uh, and the other thing to remember in terms of, the, of victimization is 95% of those who are victimized are male. And this is not to say that women are not being uh, killed or targeted by police or trans folks are not being targeted, killed by police. But overarchingly, it is men who are being fatally shot and, and killed more, more, more often. Um, and also, they tend to be between 20 and 40 years old. Uh, according to Yale and UPenn study, and this is important for us, these racial disparities have not changed for five years. And this is important because it's during these five years that we've done things like body cams and all of these other sorts of reforms. Um, according to research, oh, and also the total number of killings really hasn't changed either, as I mentioned as, I mentioned as well. Um, according to research, people with mental illness and those uh, untreated mental illness, which are in the population are about one in 50 people, are 16 times more likely to be killed in an interaction with law enforcement than anyone else. Um, further, uh, according to data analyzed by the People's Policy Project, people, and come back to this class question, people are more likely to kill poor people. And so uh, across race, so here you see that in terms of, of quintile, right, the, the, the uh, chances of, of, of being uh, uh, killed by, by police go, go up as you go down the quintiles pretty steadily. Um, and also, even when we look across race, uh, class remains a really significant variable. So in other words, even within racial categories, right, with white folks, black folks, and Latinx populations, you see these same trends of class impacting whether or not they're likely to have a fatal encounter with police. Um, looking at the chat quickly, um, I would absolutely, and so would many of the scholars, would characterize it as rebellion, Paul, but we can talk about what the word rebellion means. Um, and yes, and, and, and uh, Dr. Taylor is going to speak to these issues in the video, absolutely, and perhaps we can talk more about that afterwards. Um, excellent questions, excellent points. Um, Yes, correct, Rob, from, from the research, correct. Great quote, thank you so much. Uh, now looking at California data, now looking at California data, um, and we see similar trends. So police killed far more people in California than in any other state since 2013. However, not at the highest rate, and I'll show that in a graph here, here in a moment. Generally speaking, uh, the total number of police killed by, or total people killed by police since 2013 is just uh, under 1,400. Um, what I want to get to is down here at the bottom is that black folks were 3.8 times as likely to be killed by police as whites in California and Latinx folks were one and a half times as likely to be killed from these, these same statistics. Um, looking further here. Yes, correct, Paul. You are absolutely correct in your statistic as well. Um, looking at the graphs below, and this is kind of demonstrating what I meant about the difference between the total number of people killed in California compared to other states and the rate of people killed in California compared to other states. And so on the left here, you have the total number, right? And you see California up at the top just killing it, right? No pun intended, right? Just just ab absolutely the high. Um, yes, yes. And this is all from SJPD. I'm, I'm trying to stay... Um, within the, the bounds of our committee, which is not speaking to sheriff's departments and all that, although I'm, I'm wi absolutely willing to do so. Um, and then here on the rate side, we see that California actually is down here. So, so still toward the top, but not nearly as high as, as total. And we still have a disproportionate um, um, uh, sort of killing of, of, of black folks and other people of color. I wanna now move to local data. And I'm gonna rely on one of the best um, investigative reports that's been done locally, which was by the, the Mercury News uh, in the past couple of years, uh, looking at data from 2015 to 2020. And there's some other studies as well that I'm mentioning, but I'm just gonna to touch on them both quickly. So data suggests that black adults are 6.6 .6 times more likely and Latinx adults 2.2 times more likely uh, to be given a local infraction by SJPD as a result of a non-traffic stop. So this was from um, a study uh, across California that looked at um, not sort of stop and frisk kind of behaviors, but folks who are just basically being stopped and questioned or, or, or um, um, otherwise interrogated by police officers and seeing what happened from those interactions. And we're finding that uh, disproportionately people of color leave those interactions with, with something behind, right? With, with a, a ticket, a record, an arrest, something happened, right? And in a much higher rate. Uh, a little bit more concerning for us 
um, are some of these statistics from the Mercury News study. And I pulled this directly from the Mercs. They had such great um, um, uh, 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 stats here and, and, and uh, um, sort of graphic representations. And so I'll let you go through some of this on your own for sake of time. But the one thing that I want to point out is our note here at the bottom. This is also featured in our Silicon Valley Pain Index, is that between 2015 and 2020, no San Jose police officer has been prosecuted for killing someone despite 19 fatal encounters with the police, 15 of which involve people of color. And that ranked San Jose number one in the entire Bay Area for fatal encounters with police. So I find that to be surprising for most people. Most people, when I ask, like, which police department has killed the most people, uh, many of them actually do not mention San Jose. They go with Oakland, they go with San Francisco or whoever. Uh, it, it's actually San Jose. And, and of all of those killings, there's not been a single prosecution. And um, that's also been, I will tell you, from for a public reaction, a large response to the Silicon Valley Pain Index has been that statistic. So it's the reason I bring it up again here, because when we've mentioned it to the public, uh, it, it's we've had a, a reaction of surprise and concern. Yes, thank you, Sandra, for adding additional resources on uh, uh, statistics for, uh, for our, our differently abled populations and others. Thank you so much. And so I want to also go into a little bit of international comparison um, and, and, and see, like, how do we compare um, for, yes, thank you, Sh Sh Siobhan. It, we also have to look at you know, what's happening once, once officers are, are um, accused or, or, or once, once we find that there are these kinds of abuses, what happens or what doesn't happen, right? Thank you, Poncho, for posting the notes. And so international comparisons. In the, in the industrial Western world, in the quote unquote first world, among wealthy nations, we're off the charts. We're, we're frankly not comparable with other wealthy quote unquote first world Western nations. And you can see that clearly here. Um, I don't even have to get into the numbers. You're going to see it visually represented, right? But here's something else I do need to tell you is that this, what people have done with these statistics is then, is then say, well, the United States killed the United States, you know, police officers in the U S kill more than anybody in the world. That is not true. So I, I, I really want to make sure that we're working with correct information. We only lead the, the, the sort of Western first world among wealthy nations. There are nations like Brazil and the Philippines and others who are way off the charts, who actually make us look pretty sane. Um, now, but the thing to remember there is these are states that have fully militarized police, police forces. And, and those police forces have been completely unleashed on certainly certain populations in those, in those, in those regions. So for example, in Brazil, you have the military occupation of their ghettos, which are called favelas. And the favelas are actually up on hills, which allows police forces and, and coercive forces to essentially imprison them up on these hills, up on these mountaintops, right? And so because of their sort of um, uh, uh, historical legacies of military occupation and junta in, in Brazil and their other legacies like we have of settler colonialism and slavery and these sorts of things, their state has developed a hyper violent police force, right? That is really unlike anywhere else in the world. I, I could tell a similar but different history for the Philippines and anyone that's been watching their uh, drug war, for example, should know that, that they're taking some hints from the US drug war, but then taking it to a scale that, that frankly has not been seen here um, in terms of scale or rate of, of violence in terms of what we call extrajudicial killings. Extrajudicial judicial killings just mean police are ex executing people. And Brazil and Philippines and a couple other places in the world are the global capitals for extrajudicial killing by police officers. Not to say it doesn't happen in the United States, it absolutely does. But I wanna be very clear about where we fall in the world and what these statistics actually mean. Uh, I also wanna talk briefly and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause so we can, we can chat for our video. Um, I wanna talk briefly about the fact that, you know, we talk a, a great deal about police violence, but we end up talking only about when people die. And that's actually a very limited conversation. And, and I, I'm so happy that we had a, a recent uh, investigation. Exactly, Paul, 
yes, Paul, absolutely. And, and we have some other we have some other examples of, of this phenomenon of folks uh, being deeply injured as well from interactions with SJPD. And so this investigative work was done by uh, NBC News in the Marshall Project, and they actually ended up focusing on SJPD. But we have to give SJPD some credit here. And the reason one of the reasons that they focused on SJPD uh, wasn't necessarily because they had a theory that they would be the worst or something. But like I mentioned earlier today, almost no police agencies actually keep data on this stuff, killings, let alone injuries. And so because SJPD actually kept data on injuries, they were one of the focuses of this recent study that looked at nine cities. Right. But when they looked, SJPD was among the worst of the nine. OK, just to kind of keep that in mind. So what did they find? Well, according to the CDC, since 2000, 2015, 400,000 people have been treated in emergency rooms following interactions with police. And I want us to think about this for a minute. Some of these can be very, very light kinds of injuries where they're being taken to the ER out of caution. And I mentioned this in one of the bullets. In other cases, they're taking the ER because they have to get out of, out of necessity of injury, right? And some of these injuries can be things that affect people for the rest of their lives, not just in sort of the trauma of it or in the, in the, the, you know, the PTSD of it, perhaps. But if you get a significant injury that keeps you from working, that puts you on disability for the rest of your life, you know, these are things that absolutely can impact a person in their family's opportunity structure for life, right? These kinds of, of, of injuries. Um, and so at any rate, um, 400K since 2015, uh, more than half of them, uh, more than half of, of stops that involve force with police officers in this country end up in an emergency room visit. Um, about 1,300 people were sent to the ER after interactions with San Jose PD between 2017 and 2020. 60% of those were from control holds. 20% of those were from gunshot wounds. And 10% of those were from the use of impact weapons. So like batons, impact being hit with stuff. Batons, uh, rubber bullets, these sorts of things. So these are useful statistics for us in this group, right? Um, injuries during arrest have cost the city $26 million since 2010, and that's just injury stuff. That's not um, uh, uh, unlawful death suits. Not, that's just from the injury suits. And, and like I mentioned before, SGPD was, was one of the highest rates of, of injury or trips to the emergency room from police contact. But again, we're not sure if that's because they were just better at keeping the records, just doing it out of more caution, or whether they were actually hurting more people. So I, I want to be fair to SGPD in terms of that statistic. Um, and so I want to stop here because next we're going to move into, we're going to close with our video. And so I, I want to leave a, a minute for a question or two um, before we do that, because that's going to, that's going to suck up the rest of my time. Um, so please do jump in. I'd love anyone who hasn't jumped in yet too. That would be great. Any questions, comments, things you want me to, to, to go deeper into? Um. Well, thanks for sharing all this stuff. I definitely would love to maybe potentially have you come to our youth council too and break some of this stuff down. Yeah, this is really important um, because a lot of the youth that are part of our, our youth council took to the streets last year, you know, um, you know, to march, to, to push for defund the police, to try to get a seat at the table, to change some of these policies. And I really think having the full context, like with all this data, can help us be strategic, you know, as we're pushing forward and working, you know, with this, with the Reimagine Committee. So thank you. This is really helpful. Thank you. And I'm happy to do that. And the other thing that I'll say, y'all, is, is please, if you don't have time to ask me questions during the presentation today, follow up on email. Uh, uh, maybe Pancho can throw that in the chat for me real quick. Um, follow up with me on email. Follow up with us at the Institute. I'm happy to go deeper into this with anyone who needs it, okay? So, so the other thing that I wanna say is what I'm doing right now, what we're doing right now is our job. This is our role in this committee. It's not to call shots. It's not to say what to do, those sorts of things. It's to provide as much of this information as we possibly can for whatever you need it. So anytime, anytime anyone wants any of this stuff or wants, wants to, to get into it more or anything like that, please reach out to me, reach out to us. We're at the ready. Go ahead, Jamal. What's up, everybody? Um, thanks again, man, for the info. I just wanted, um, I'm trying to go back through the stats uh, because like you said, there's a lot of numbers coming at us, but can you contextualize what, um, 
what these statistics mean in terms of uh, kind of the narrative that, that of what set policing in San Jose looks like uh, compared to nationally compared to the other large cities of its of its kind. Uh, it's a good question, Jamal, and it's a very difficult one to answer because there's all kinds of points of comparison, right? And there's all kinds of contextual differences between cities and regions in terms of what's going on with their police forces and what's going on in those communities. So I will say that on some levels, SJPD is sort of on trend with other police forces in the state and in the country on many of these issues. I think the other reason it's really important to look at the local data, that Bay Area study, is because those are more equal comparisons in terms of the kinds of things they're dealing with, um, region, uh, politics of the area, all those sorts of things. And so it's, it's a difficult question to answer quickly. And what I would say is like, we have to answer the, that question like more specifically, like how do they compare on X? How do they compare with other cities of this size? How do they compare? And then we can, we can get into some of that. As a broad narrative, just like if you want my no bullshit answer, is that we're facing a lot of the very similar uh, problems here as, as everywhere else. They just have our own flavors, right? And, and some of that has to do with the histories that like Paul and I went into, and some of it has to do with other just unique aspects of where we live. There are also some things that they're uniquely doing better than other, other police departments, if we're going to be honest and clear, right? And some of that has to do with the record keeping, some of that has to do with what we're doing right now. So, so you know, I think we have to be um, sort of vigilant in asking and answering those kinds of questions. J Jamal, does my answer make any sense, fam? I hope I'm not skirting your question. No, 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 absolutely. I, I appreciate that. That that that's kind of what I was hoping you would uh, give some give some context yeah. to. So appreciate that. All right, everybody. I want to keep us moving because I, I want to make sure we can we can fit this in. I don't know if we can watch the whole the whole thing. Um, well, we're going to go for it, um, and then we'll see We'll see how much time we have at the other side. And at the other side, we're hopefully going to have a quick breakout, and then we're going to talk people's budget for a second before we uh, hit our last agenda items and skirt. So, so thanks for being patient. Let me uh, switch screen share here. Oops. One second. So to contextualize this, this is a few years old, right? This is from 2016. And this is Kianga Yamada Taylor, a professor from the, the head of African-American studies at Princeton University. Um, and she actually wrote a, a very famous book now from uh, Black Rebellion, from Black Lives Matter to Black. <laughs> it's in the notes. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and get it started. She's gonna speak for herself and make all of these historical connections to the actual Black Lives Matter and criminal justice movements that we saw across the country. First in 2014 and 2015 is the first phase of Black Lives Matter rebellions. And then again in 2020 and beyond in the second phase of the rebellions that of course happened well after this video. So remember that this is dated a little bit, but she's gonna make these historical connections for us. On April 12th, 1865, the American Civil War came to an end. Oh. Hey, I'm Alex Honnold, and to support the work of the nonprofit, <laughs> I'm back with Omaze to give you a chance to win a 4x4 Sprinter van with an $80,000 conversion from van. Sorry. When the Union Army officially accepted the unconditional surrender of the Confederacy at the steps of a courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia, the Union Army, led by 200,000 Black soldiers, destroyed the institution of slavery and as a result of their victory, Black people were no longer property, but were now to be citizens of the United States. The Civil Rights Act of 1866, the first declaration of civil rights in the United States, read in part, quote, citizens of every race and color, without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to full and equal benefit of the laws and proceedings for the security of person and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. 150 years later to the day, on April 12th, 2015, 
217 miles north of the Appomattox Courthouse, where the Civil War finally came to an end. Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old Black man, was chased by Baltimore police. His crime? Making eye contact with the police and running away. At 9 a.m., Freddie Gray was caught by police and loaded into a van. By the time he emerged from the van 45 minutes later, 80% of his spinal cord had been severed, his neck almost snapped in half. Now, I know that people in Baltimore know the story of Freddie Gray better than I do, but I think that his death and the subsequent hung jury in the first trial regarding his death symbolize the continued racial inequality experienced by most Black people in this country. In other words, the span of time from the end of the Civil War and the inception of rights of Black citizenship to the state-sanctioned beating and torture of Freddie Gray symbolizes the very real difference between formal equality before the law and the self-determination and self-possession that is inherent in actual freedom. The right to be free from oppression, the right to make determinations about your life free from duress, coercion, or threat of harm. 150 years after emancipation, the country still requires a movement that makes the most basic of claims that Black Lives Matter. The question must be asked then whether or not the United States is actually capable of transforming the platitudes of freedom into actual rights for whom access is not determined by race or class status. On at least some level, we have to consider that if our government were actually interested in freedom for the vast majority of Black people, it would exist. But the promise of freedom assumes that it actually existed in the United States in the first place. In fact, Black people were not freed into a just society. Black people were not freed into an American dream. We were freed into what Malcolm X described as an American nightmare. Far from being the land of the free, we live in a land of savage inequalities, where 400 billionaires live alongside 45 million poor people. Since 2007, Well, it looks like it muted of unfettered opportunity. And it's the economic inequality at the heart of American capitalism that is often obscured by racial inequality. Because when black people are 27% of the 45 million poor people in the US, we are told it's because of black culture. It is because black people are lazy. And this prompts us to interrogate interrogate the morality of black people and not a system that produces 45 million poor people in the first place. This stereotyping of African-Americans is not however only about poverty. It shapes all of the public perceptions of black people. And so not only do these racist characterizations hide the systemic nature of black inequality, but they also contribute to an atmosphere that regards black people as a menace, as criminals, and generally as a problem population that must be patrolled and policed. The police as an institution have fully absorbed these stereotypes of, and racism as it pertains to African-Americans. There really is no other way to understand the casual disregard for black life in the hands of the police. Consider how Michael Slager, Officer Michael Slaver, Slager in South Carolina took aim as, he were, as if he were doing target practice when he shot a fleeing Walter Scott eight times in the back. Recall how 12-year-old Tamir Rice was shot within 1.6 seconds of the police arriving on the scene, but more importantly, remember how he lay dying unattended as two police officers stood passively by, refusing to help him. A handful of 
these cases have become well known to people across the country, but they cannot convey the daily terror, brutality, and humiliation at the hands of the police that course through black communities across this country. All of this has contributed to the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it is the movement that has exposed to the world what black America has always known. The police are not intended to preserve law and order. They are agents of lawlessness and disorder. They are not out of control. Instead, they have been unleashed in poor and working class black communities. And for those of you who think I'm exaggerating, consider this. Over the last decade, the city of Chicago has paid more than $500 million to settle police brutality lawsuits. In 10 years, New York City has paid on average $100 million a year to settle police brutality in misconduct cases. Police murder and violence are simply the cost of doing business in cities across the country. Because any other public institution, including hospitals, clinics, libraries, schools, responsible for that kind of debt and misconduct would have their budgets cut and their employees fired. When the Chicago public schools were facing a billion dollar deficit in 2013, Mayor Rahm Emanuel closed 52 public schools, but no one dare suggest closing police precincts because they are too costly. And these issues are related because when you close schools and you close hospitals and libraries, when you provide no jobs, when you keep people in segregated, substandard, lead infested housing, you are creating the conditions that justify the presence of the police. You are not transforming those conditions that create crime in the first place. And when the most powerful country in the world cannot reign in its police, it is not because they cannot, it is because they will not. In 2015, American police last year killed 1,134 people. Young black men were nine times more likely to be killed by police than other Americans. But these numbers are just the tip of the iceberg. According to the findings of a study conducted by the Bureau of Justice Statistics on police homicides, in the years 2003 to 2009, in 2011, American police killed 7,427 people. That's an average of 928 people a year. And if you add that average up for 2010, 2012, 2013, and 2014, we are talking about over 11,000 people killed by the police in the last 11 years, a disproportionate number of them black and brown. Consider that in 2014, 58 American soldiers were killed in Iraq, or that 78 people were killed by law enforcement in Canada in 2014, or that from 2010 to 2014, in police in England killed four people. In Germany, the police killed no one in 2013 and 2014. In China, with a population four and a half times the size of the United States, the police killed 12 people in 2014. So there has never been a golden age of good policing in the United States that we can point to where the police were killing on average that number of people or not killing one at all. Because the police have always reflected the racism, inequality, and brutality that exists in this country. And it's happening at a time of unprecedented black political power. We have more black elected officials in Congress, state houses, and local government than in any other time in this country's history. The president is black. The nation's top law enforcement officer is black. And this was the fulfillment of a strategy at the end of the 1960s that called for black control of black communities that we should have our own politicians, 
our own elected officials. Well, it's been almost 50 years, and I think that we can say that that strategy has failed. Because when a black mayor of Baltimore calls for the National Guard, a unit that is led by a black woman, to put down a rebellion of black youngsters and black millennials, then we have come to the end of one phase of the black movement, and we are entering into another. Many like to compare the movement of today with the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But the Baltimore rebellion of last April conjured up memories for me at least of the rebellions of the 1960s. Because African Americans then, like today, were not fighting, at the end of the 60s, were not fighting Jim Crow or legal discrimination. But they were struggling against the injustice of poverty, unemployment, substandard housing, and police brutality none of which was against the law, but all of which was at the root of black hardship. And so whether you agree or do not agree with the uprising is not important. What is important is what the rebellion communicated about justice, freedom, and equality in our country. But I ask you to consider the rebellion also in the way that Martin Luther King Jr. did in the 1960s. And as we prepare to celebrate his birthday on Monday, I want to end with a quote from him that was, that was from an article he wrote in the aftermath of a Detroit uprising in 1967 that was much more, it was much bigger and much more destructive than what happened in Baltimore. And here's what King said, the other King that we often don't hear from. But this is what he said, quote, I am not sad that black Americans are rebelling. This was not only inevitable, but imminently desirable. Without this magnificent ferment among Negroes, the old evasions and procrastinations would have continued indefinitely. Black people have slammed the door shut on a past of deadening passivity. Except for the reconstruction years, they have never in their long history on American soil struggled with such creativity and courage for their freedom. These are our bright years of emergence. Though they are painful ones, they cannot be avoided. In these trying circumstances, the Black Revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing the evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. Today's dissenters tell the complacent majority that the time has come when further invasion of social responsibility in a turbulent world will court disaster and death. America has not changed yet, has, has not yet changed because so many people think it need not change. But this is the illusion of the damned. America must change because 23 million black citizens will no longer live supinely in a wretched past. They have left the valley of despair. They have found strength and struggle. Joined by white allies, they will shake the, wall, the prison walls until they fall. America must change. Thank you. Cool, thanks y'all. And thank you for your patience for a long presentation and kind of long video, but from the chat, it looks like it was, uh, it was appreciated. So I'm gonna turn it over to Poncho for a quick transition. So um, I just wanted to let folks know that we were originally planning on having a breakout conversation to, to talk about, uh, to talk more about data and the information to be useful for us. What we're going to do is instead of actually having that breakout session now, it'll be part of our homework. Now that we have some resources, I shared um, the link to the shared file in the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you to Siobhan for sharing some press articles um, uh, like that were really useful and helpful to look at, at some of these topics that we're gonna be diving into next time. And thank you so much for, for, um, uh, for Sandra for us also sharing a number of incredible articles and data sets that are very helpful about the context around those that have disabilities and their experience with the criminal justice system and, so, um, and, and other resources. So 
Um, we invite people to go check that out. Um, and uh, but before that, we're gonna um, uh, we're gonna ask you uh, ask folks to think about as part of your homework for the next session because we'll do a breakout to identify what other data local data things that we might need from the city from the police department and others that could be helpful for it we're not going to take about the 15 minutes we're going to do then but uh, right now we're going to transition to a conversation about the people's budget um, survey process so send it back to your team well so very quickly, y'all, we have about five minutes left and we're going to use them all. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my research coordinator, Miranda Worthen, and another member of our human rights working group, two other members of our working group, uh, core team member Soma de Bourbon and working group member Michael Dow. Uh, Miranda, go ahead and take it. Can I share a screen, Poncho? Let me see if um, I can fix that. Can you, you let, me, let me add you to it. Sorry. Okay, there thank we go. you. Um, and I'll let Miranda start. Thanks, Actually, go ahead, Miranda. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks. It's nice to um, be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to share um, what we're working on. Um, to just and explain the People's Bread Project briefly, and then I think I'll turn it over to Soma um, to share some about one facet of it. Um, so the overall goal of the People's Budget Project is to learn what community members in San Jose think about community safety, policing, and the city budget. Um, and part of that task is to really learn at a population all the different uh, communities or similarities. Hey, Miranda, you may want to stop. You're um, in up terms a of bit. people's experiences and. You're breaking up a little bit. Okay, right? maybe, maybe I'll turn it to Michael. Or turn it to Michael. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, really happy to see all of you. So kind of following up on Miranda's description is the People's Budget of San Jose is really broadly trying to explore ideas of community safety policing in relation to the San Jose city budget. And this summer, what we've done is conduct focus groups, um, interviews with various populations, that are helping support some of the findings and the conversations that are currently going on here in San Jose and particularly in this group, um, GRIPS. Um, so today what we're presenting is just a brief overview of some of the findings for our focus group discussions leading into the survey solicitation that we're having um, for the second part of this project, which is a core piece of what we're doing. Um, so what you're seeing here on the screen um, from our colleague Soma is just a, a brief overview of some of the findings that we have as a team um, uh, derived. So I guess somebody can go through okay. some of these uh, findings, please. So I think we have five minutes or less, and this was pulled together last minute because we're not um, quite there yet. So just so you know, probably misspellings and all sorts of things. And can someone just like be like, stop when five minutes is up? Thank you, because you know us professors, we're going to go on forever. Um, okay. So organizations, this is a collaborative effort um, started with Sacred Heart Community Services and the Human Rights Institute. This is just a list of some of the organizations that were involved and conducted focus groups after the collaborative focus guide was developed between Sacred Heart and the Human Rights Institute. And so um, a bunch of different groups were involved and a lot of focus groups were conducted then what we did over the summer was we looked at that data and um, as a team, we had um, four different folks coding or five maybe, um, coding the information from that. And we're from different perspectives. So my perspective is more critical race theory. You know, we had all these and, and human, then the folks doing human rights, um, you know, analysis. So we had different perspectives and then we would get together and be like, hey, these are the themes that I saw. These are the themes, and it was a really interesting collaborative effort to also look at this data, not just the way that it was collected and done. So I think that that's also interesting to think about. Um, as far as findings, I don't think we have time to go over all of them, but I can give you kind of the three themes, or these were the, the th three themes that we came up with after you know reviewing all the notes from the focus groups, listening to the um, recordings that were given to us. 
Um, and and these in each theme, there were also sub themes, right? So basic human rights for vulnerable populations. Um, the second one, stop policing complex social problems like mental health issues. And then the third one was people really did want stronger ties to their community members, right? Um, and I can give you, um, am I done or can I keep going? Do people want me to keep going? I mean, okay. So theme one, this is kind of the four sub areas that came out of theme one. Housing was something that was brought up in every single focus group. So it was key. Um, mental health and other basic human rights was another area that was very common in these um, focus groups. Um, native specific resources, and I can talk about that at some other point because that's from some focus groups that I did. In addition, I did two focus groups following the People's Budget Guide with Native folks. Um, and then infrastructure was the last piece. Um, I can probably not have time to do this, but I have a couple of quotes from like each area, you know, money to build homes for homeless, more shelters for people to sleep at night, housing. This is just some of the things that people were asking for. Housing is a basic human right for living in a high cost area. So one thing was housing was something that was brought up in the most conservative groups to the most, you know, uh, to folks that were like, police abolition, right? So, or to folks that were like, I think we need some police to help us. And even if they don't really help us, I want, you know, like, so So housing was something that was very clearly, um, everyone was interested in having for um, people that were struggling. Mental health was another area, wraparound mental health services needed, not just, um, you know, tiny homes, mental health workers for individuals with mental health and drug addiction, um, again, these are the, you know, shortened hand for the focus groups where those were done. Native specific resources. Um, okay, is it five minutes? You want me to cut me at this time? You got like two minutes. Oh, okay. I'll keep going if you want. So the native, <laughs> okay, so native, you know, um, and, and I'm going to read this one quote and then I'll probably keep going. Uh, let me see if I can minimize this. I think particularly with Native people and whether it be Native children, Native women, Native men, there's a trust issue, a lack of trust to other people, to outside people. And so I think getting as many Native women, like, and then she named a bunch of women in the group, who can interact with Native people, there's a sense of trust there, you know. And so there, there was um, an acknowledgement that, you know, that some of these resources we need, but we also need to be careful that specific communities need those resources. We need, we need to be careful and, and mention, you know, and, and be attentive to the needs of specific communities that they're run and done by native people. So that was another thing, infrastructure. I don't think I need to go over. We all know what infrastructure is. Okay, well, okay, I'll go back. Lighting, people, a lot of people mentioned lighting in several different groups um, and places that are safe right, places to park, places that are making those places available in our community. The second theme, which kind of goes along with what, you know, the video and what Bill was talking about, you know, this stop policing complex social problems. And I know these are long titles for sub themes, but it, it was a lot of complex information in there. And so um, I'll probably end with this slide because I know we're, we're pretty much out of time. But um, police cannot provide solutions to mental health or addiction problems. So I like there was this acknowledgement that people want solutions, but that they're not getting them from the police. Um, and so this was something that came up in, in almost every focus group. And then police lack racial and cultural knowledge, appreciation and training. So there was a sense in a lot of the groups that police are um, policing folks because of the color of their skin or because they're unhoused or because of um, some other reasons besides the fact that, you know, you know, yeah, I don't know, besides that they're actually doing something wrong. I don't know. Right. So that is part of what was happening. And then there was a lot of recommendations for non-police solutions. And I think that's probably my time and I'll end there. Thank you so much, Soma. And I'm just going to jump back into close because Miranda's having some trouble with her audio. Um, and I want to thank Michael and Soma for jumping in on a very, very quick debriefing on some of our results. 
So just so you know, we will have a final uh, sort of full report from the focus group results that will be available to this group and also be available via our website. I'll make sure everybody knows once those results are published and then you can read through all of those kinds of things on your own and see more about what, what sort of Summa was describing. The last thing I wanna do is pitch the survey. So right now we are soliciting the people's budget survey and we need all of your help. We need your help to take the survey and to get everybody else you know who are San Jose residents to take the survey too. This is your chance to get all of those kinds of voices we want represented in these conversations represented. Um, and this is where we're gonna actually move from what we think we learned from the focus groups to see if in fact the broader San Jose population uh, reflects those kinds of, of concerns and those kinds of perspectives. And so this is gonna be partly what really informs the decisions of this group, along with all of our own histories and experiences, is this data from what the rest of our communities actually want and what they actually experience. And so Miranda just put the link to the, to the survey in the chat. The survey is available in eight languages, y'all. So all you got to do is get people to the landing page and pretty much everyone in our community should be able to move from there in their own native language. Um, in addition, if there's any problems with access or you need any promotional materials, and by the way, Poncho, we'll make sure you have those to give to the group. I think you already have them already. So Poncho can distribute those materials. We have the flyers in multiple languages as well. They have QR codes to access. The survey is super quick. You can do it on your phone, your laptop, any electronic device. And we will close with that. Thank you so much for your patience, everyone. We may be staying a couple minutes more for public comment, Poncho, but as far as our presentation for the day, uh, we're finished. And again, we just want to thank everybody for your patience, giving us a few extra minutes. Thanks, Paul and others, for asking for those few extra minutes. And thanks again to my team, Miranda, Michael, and Soma, for joining us for these last few minutes of the meeting today. Thank, thank you, Dr. Armelin. I really appreciate incredible, uh, incredible resources that you're able to provide. Um, the last item that uh, before we do public, uh, take some additional public comment and conversation is just wanted to remind folks that we've sent out to the members of the advisory committee to uh, fill out a survey um, about the different uh, committees. So if you're interested in perhaps serving, showing a preference of which of the committees, there's a brief description that was sent out to folks ahead of time. And so these are again, proposed ad hoc committees uh, for consideration and um, we wanna organize them, but in order to actually make sure that we're not violating um, any of the principles of the Brown Act, uh, we need to make sure that we uh, can comp compose a committee that does not include a majority of the members of the, the voting members of the actual committee. So we're going to be doing that, having that conversation uh, soon. And if you could fill out the survey, I'll send it out again, including a link to, again, these resources. So Dr. Uh, Armelin's presentation, um, all that is included in there. So please, uh, if you get a chance to respond to that, and then we'll try to throw in additional resources. Again, if folks have reports or resources that you'd like to be able to send us, I can I can happen to throw them in the resource file, um, and we'll be sharing that with uh, with folks here. So with that, um, we are going to open it up for public comment. And I see, Paul, you've got your hand up and Magnolia, uh, your second. Go ahead, Paul. Yes, I would like to wait until the last, until everybody has had a chance to speak. I, I spoke earlier and I would like to hear from other members of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's, that's very respectful of you. So we'll go Magnolia and, uh, and then Molly. Hi, this is Commissioner Magnolia Siegel of the Charter Review Commission of San Jose. The charter is being reviewed currently by uh, about 21 commissioners appointed by the city council to, uh, for really specific reasons, but on, in terms of this topic, policing, the education day is coming up. It's this Monday, um, so just in a few days. Uh, it starts at 5.30 but the education portion starts at six o'clock. It is a really wonderful lineup with um, Brian Core of NACOL, followed by uh, Paul Parker, who has just uh, in San Diego, he has a, um, a model that is um, entirely community-based oversight. We also have an example of San Jose. We have a former um, independent police officer who will be speaking on the San Jose model, which is just the auditor. And then we have a, an example of communities that have both an auditor and also um, community oversight commission. 
And so that's the city of Davis, but that particular auditor works for many cities. And so we really encourage everybody to come to this education day uh, because it's a good lineup. So again, it's, it's this coming Monday, August 23rd at six o'clock. You can find it on the city's website, Charter Review Commission. Um, and the link is there and certainly public comment during that time is welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Molly, and then LaToya. Good morning, my name is Molly McLeod. Um, I wanna make sure that I get added to the list so I can find out when there are meetings, including the, the ad hoc. So, um, and I also would ask that um, any of the resources that are put out, if you've got images, that it has alt text, image descriptions for those whose um, vision's changing like mine. Um, sometimes if it's pixelated, try to squeeze it open, it's not gonna work. And so that's a, a basic access practice. I'm wearing my shirt, access is, solidarity is, disability justice is love, um, created by Alice Wong, Mia Mingus, and Sandy Ho. Um, this is, um, access is love is part of the BIPOC disabled queer led organizing movement. Um, and so when I say, um, say the word disabled, um, I mean that. It's also, we need to show respect to however people ident I want to identify, but I would say that this is one of the areas of um, greatest opportunity for, for learning um, among this group is because it's got among the least representation um, and um, it, with the exception of like debug and Lori and talking about people with disabilities <laughs> who've actually been harmed or killed. Um, I'm closing in uh, memory of my son who uh, on Friday it will be three years from his death. I'm going to say his name, Jeremiah McLeod, um, my son who is black and was um, beaten by police and incarcerated and pushed on that um, path from uh, as early as second grade. Thanks. Thank you, Molly. Um, Latoya? Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just uh, kind of uh, recruit for a couple of things. One, our youth council here. Um, we have, uh, like we have this reimagining public safety space. We also have a version of this that is youth led um, and youth run. And we are specifically recruiting youth that are uh, age 21 and under. Um, that you know are represent the communities we're talking about that are system impacted, um, and so I know a couple of you have already reached out to me in the chat. I'm going to drop my email in here um, because we would love to include the youth voice as much as possible. Um, with that being said, I'm also facilitating a couple of more youth uh, youth led youth run subcommittees where youth are getting compensated. Um, one for the realignment of DJJ. Um, and the other one for realignment of DJJ specific to LGBTQ plus affairs. Um, and so that is um, in, uh, in partnership with FLY, Fresh Lifelines for Youth um, and the Youth Advisory Council. So if you have youth um, that are interested in being a part of that process, please let me know. Um, and then also the Charter Review Commission. I'm also facilitating the Youth Council for the Charter Review Commission, which is how our city is governed. Um, so these are these are uh, paid opportunities for young folks to get involved. This Saturday at Paseo de Robles, which is that Paseo that's right next to Makla, um, we're going to be hosting a community resource fair. So I sit on the Transportation Equity Task Force um, and ask them if they could just fund a community resource fair so we could bring the resources to the community. Um, so we're going to have organizations like Debug, Young Women's Freedom Center, um, and many others. We're going to have the Office of Voter Education and Registration there. Getting, we want to get people registered to vote. And we're also going to be giving information about how to get engaged in these processes. So um, I'm actually thinking, well, we, it'd be great for us to, we'll probably have an iPad or something set up for people to take the survey that you're talking about. Um, that's what this whole community resource uh, event, event is about. It's about getting resources to the community and engaging the community in this process and collecting data to inform our work. So it's gonna be at that Paseo. I'll drop my email in here I, uh, to send you guys flyers. Um, we're going to be feeding people. It's going to be from 10 to 3. 
Um, yeah, we'll be feeding folks. There's going to be live music. We're going to have stations for uh, young people. Um, and you'll also be able to try out some of our new um, emerging mobility, like modes of transportation too. So be pretty cool stuff. So I'll drop my email in here and please reach out to me if you have any youth that want to be a part of any of these uh, councils or you want to get information on the community resource fair. Thank you. Thank you, Toya. Appreciate your leadership and leadership of the youth that are, that are guiding this process. Um, Paul, take, a, take us home. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, presenters, uh, especially the um, kind of like overview of the sociological, uh, political, economic, uh, existential perspective from, uh, from a reputed uh, uh, university. My niece is uh, got her master's degree from that university. And one of the historical societies that I'm connected to, every single one of the Chicanos are graduates of that particular university, and they were participants in the first 1968 Chicano walkout, where prior in June, which was a couple of months before uh, Tommy Smith and Juan Carlos um, uh, declared their solidarity with the Panthers in Mexico City. And so here it is that you have like uh, that kind of connection. So I'm really um, uh, enthused about working with uh, San Jose State with regard to centering uh, the Chicano experience within the context of these conversations, which I think has been lacking and it, it, it is sorely needed. Um, Danny Trevino, Danny Trevino. This man was a, uh, he was a, an active participant within the context of the Black Berets. And the Black Berets were an organization that the reason why they were, they were, they were the BLM. They were the BLM of the Chicanos here in San Jose. And so this history is lacking. And because of it, we don't have a context by which to move forward with respect to uh, policing. And so it's, it's, it's needed. And I would also like to thank Lori for giving her, uh, her life experience because ultimately what we charge the officers to do, we afford them a particular responsibility. And we say, as a society, we are giving you permission that in the event of a particular situation where you must take a human life, that you do it in the furtherance of not only protection of yourself, that is a no, not just yourself, but the community as a whole. That includes the person that is experiencing whatever they're going through at that particular moment. Okay, this isn't either or, this is about the uh, a holistic approach to policing. And, 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 and I really believe that Lori and stories like hers need to be centered within the context of the recruitment uh, process with uh, San Jose Police Department. That, that, is a, that is a policy that we can at least submit to council right away. Say, hey, we need lived, paid, paid lived experience being centered within the recruitment process of the police department because these uh, recruits need to know right from the beginning the, the, the ultimate consequence of the decision that they're going to make. And they may be challenged with a decision to take another human life. And so they must be sensitized to that. And I think that that should be a paid uh, position and that uh, they recruit three times a year. Three times a year, I just checked that last night. So three times a year and that these conversations and people with that kind of experience be positioned in those recruitment classes as mandatory. This is, this is what happens. And uh, it doesn't need Paul Kelly's um, assent or agreement or whether or not it uh, uh, subscribes to the brotherhood of whatever union or whatever brotherhood he's talking about. Because what we're talking about is the security of our society, the maintenance of safety, and the, 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 the paradigm shift from criminalizing the symptoms of poverty the symptoms of redlining, the symptoms of generational traumas, the, the symptoms of what happened here, July 14th, 1846, 
That's why I lobbied to get that statue removed. That's why I put that work in to have that Fallon statue removed. That is a symbol of white oppression. It is a symbol of manifest destiny. And that's why it is so important that that statue be removed from public property, that we do not as a society glorify these symbols that reflect a history that subscribed to the decapitations of Native Americans and Mexicans. And then that wasn't good enough. Then we had Leland Stanford and Peter Burnett as co-authors of the Chinese Exclusionary Act. And if that wasn't good enough, we had the native sons of the Golden West who advocated for the, uh, for the internment of the Japanese. They advocated prior to World War II, then they got into the uh, internment camps. And then while they were there, the native sons of the Golden West actually advocated and lobbied to have them kept there. These are the histories of San Jose. And these are things that we need to be comfortable talking about. And because of that, we were able to go through the four point process, reckoning, rectification, reparation, reconciliation. And that is by Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is my, one of my heroes because what he, what he has done is said that you cannot compromise that four point, uh, uh, that four point, those four points in the principles that you apply when you are trying to promote a sense of healing. And so um, uh, thank you for the time. Um, I look forward to communication with uh, uh, other people on this body. And I really, really enjoyed that video. That video was very enlightening and educational. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, any other folks on either on the committee or members of the public that would like to speak? Seeing none, I want to just, again, thank you so much, um, particularly thank you, Lori, for your very powerful and important story and the family and community that, that still struggles, um, but, um, but your power is really felt. So thank you for that. Thank you for Will and your team for your incredible work, your presentation, and um, for everyone for your contributions. You know, thank, thank you, uh, Miranda, Michael, Soma, um, and, uh, and I'm, we're looking forward to the next meeting in two weeks. And we're gonna, uh, we're gonna jump into that. And I just wanted to be able to close the meeting in honor of, um, in the memory of Jeremy McLeod. So thank you, God bless.